Welcome in to the Ots and Audibles podcast, Friday edition. I'm Matt Preem, Eric Scopel, and Jared Mack on the show. Uh, first time in a long time this week that all three of us are on. I think since maybe Monday that, that we're all on the podcast together. Uh, it's our prediction show. We're getting ready to – these guys, uh, Eric – well, Eric is coming down. Jared is going to be manning the fort in Eugene. I'm already in California uh, for Pac-12 Media Day for basketball. So it's traveling day on Friday. Um, Oregon will travel themselves. You guys were at practice Tuesday and Wednesday. So um, I was there Tuesday. I did not go to practice Wednesday. Catch us up to speed on anything important that we saw on practice Wednesday that we need to note here on the show ahead of the game. I think we can probably rule Taki Taimani out. He didn't. He wasn't at Tuesday. He wasn't at Wednesday. Uh, Dan was not asked specifically about Taki, but he was asked, could a player miss those practices and play on a Saturday? And he basically said no. He said maybe if it's an older player, which Taki is, but that you really need these players to be taking part in practice to be able right. to play on a Saturday. So I think you can rule him out. I think the – Positive. Well, I guess DJ Johnson was also not there, which is on Wednesday. On Wednesday, yeah. which is somewhat notable. Um, something certainly to monitor. We'll see if he makes the trip. If he doesn't, that could be pretty significant. This is a Cal, and we'll get to some of the Cal stuff. But this is a Cal offensive line that is really, really bad. And a player mm-hmm. like DJ could have a really big game hypothetically. And I think the thing that was positive from an injury note was, hey, Stephen Jones, back out there, not in uniform, yep. not in pads not really doing much of anything other than rehab work off to the side. But this is a guy who we haven't seen at a practice in like literally six or seven weeks. So I thought it was notable. He was at least back out there. He, when he kind of made his entrance, he, he showed up probably about five minutes into stretch. Players kind of turned and clapped and acknowledged him for returning. Everyone was, I think, pretty excited. Maybe added a little bit of a, uh, you know, enthusiasm to the day. So I thought that one was positive. Clearly he's not available this week, but I would guess you're looking at Maybe next week he starts practicing a little bit, and then the following week against Washington could be a time where he's available. And we also have to note, like, I don't know if he's a, when he's available, does he take his starting spot back? Because I think Marcus Harper and his offensive lines played really, really well. Do you want to mess with the kind of continuity there? Right. But that's a conversation down the line. But I thought notable he was at least out there. Definitely notable. Um, should talk about DJ Johnson. He was there on Tuesday during practice that we were able to see and then wasn't on Wednesday. I mean, there's a there's a decent chance that he came in, in, into practice on Wednesday when we weren't there. But again, we would have no idea about that. Um, special teams, I think, is probably the only other thing that we can really talk about, considering we don't we don't see much. Um, Oregon ran with five punters on Wednesday, including Lachlan Bruce. So it was Adam Berry, Ross James, Andrew Boyle and Alex Bales, who are who are all punting on Wednesday. Um, it, it, I have we haven't seen this before where there's all four punters back there all five punters back there uh, we've seen four as the max um, this one was a little different Bales does this rugby style of punting um, then they had a pressure kick opportunity and uh, Bales was the only one to do well um, it was, wasn't a great showing for punting this this week uh, and then other than that uh, Eric I, I don't know about you but I don't really have anything else other than I have a uh... I have a point of clarification here that I want to have a chat about. Uh, this was asked about in the – so full disclosure, uh, Matt, uh, Matt was in the Bay Area. Jared was at practice with me, but then I had to go to women's basketball media day, so I didn't end up writing the practice report. Usually Jared and I huddle up and write that. Uh, there was some disagreement apparently between the two of us of who was at fault oh, for yeah, the Ty Thompson yeah. throw to Kyler Casper. Was that a Ty pro- – because this is such a small thing, and those, those, those listening are probably confused right now. But in our practice report, which Jared wrote, uh, it, you said it went past his arms. I thought it was more catchable than that. And then we ended up having people arguing about if it was Ty's fault or not, which is hilarious because that speaks to how much people are reading into one pass in a practice yeah. that we got to watch. So what do you think? Like, who was at fault there? Was that, was that, I thought it was Kyler could have caught it, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it was a really good throw from Ty. It just probably should have been caught. I think, um, Kyler during the fastball period was a little tired and just didn't make up enough ground to get there. Okay. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't know. And I don't really 
really, really care about <laughs> which way it's written and how people <laughs> diagnose it. And now they, they judge Ty Thompson or Kyler Casper over it. Um, by, by, by the ball. way, by a play that they uh, were not present for, that they're just reading our practice report from and are trying to draw. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just tried to make it as vague as possible and as, as, normal as what it looked like as I was watching it, which was a, a well-thrown ball just out of the reach of Kyla Casper's hands. Fair enough. All right. Small thing. I just was curious to get your take on that. <laughs> sure. All right, let's, let's move to uh, some keys here. Um, I don't think there's much more to, to really break down from what we heard, what we saw in practice. This is, this is a cow game um, where – like, look, like Oregon is supposed to win this game. Jared, the line was like what opened up at twelve, and it's it's inflated all the way up to like seventeen or or eighteen points now. Um, let me uh, let me double check. That that line has just gotten so much bigger than it was originally, and and this feels like a trap game because it's Cal. They're not very good. They're they play a boring style of football. They're they're sound defensively, but it's going to be in a stadium that will be maybe half full, maybe a little more than that. Um, I, I don't anticipate it being a sold out crowd. There'll be a lot of duck fans there, no doubt, but this, the overall juice of that place is not typical of what you see at Washington state on the road or when Oregon goes to uh, even Arizona for, for a little bit. Um, this, this stadium is just very subdued if you will um and so for me like how does this team start how does this team start the the first half how, how do they come out in that second half and don't play down to your competition this is a show me game even though cal is not very good in that oregon if if they're the Rose Bowl team that we think they are uh you know or if they're that team that can get to the pac-12 championship game um don't even need to talk about the playoff, but if they're that cal, if they're that caliber of a squad, they've got to show up, and they've got to kind of put their foot down on Cal. And so for me, it's just going to be the execution. Like that's the key for me. Is how do they how do they look? Or is it sloppy? Are there penalties that make life more difficult for the offense? Do they give extra life to to Cal's offense because of stupid penalties? And how do you look when when you start the first you know first drive of offense, first drive of defense in both the first and second halves? If they come out ready to play and they they play a relatively clean game, you know they should blow this team out. But if if they're sloppy, if they lack execution, that's where games that should be blowouts end up being closer in the third and fourth quarters. It's an interesting Cal team. I kind of I, I was I've been thinking about this since I did an interview with Jackson uh, Moore from Bear Territory on Wednesday, and it's a feels like a team that's like almost caught between eras for Cal. Yeah, because you've got actually like this is the most skill talent Wilcox has ever had. They, they, have, they have some really young, exciting guys at receiver. They have Jay Knott, who's a really exciting running back, but they want to play this kind of like style that doesn't really. And I'm not because I mean they they have the lowest yards per pass attempt in the conference despite having. I don't want to say top five, top six. I don't know where they rank in the conference at receiver because there's some really good receivers in this conference. But they don't challenge teams vertically the way you probably should with the kind of guys they have outside. And they have this you know, this running back in Ott who ran for like almost 300 yards in one game. And yet it's not a run offense that really inspires much stress. I think some of it's the offensive line for them. But you feel to me it feels like this is a team that is a year or two away from actually being pretty interesting offensively but they're still kind of playing stylistically like they have under Wilcox, which is trying to grind out these games. And, you know, I, I just wonder like if you, if, if this was, you know, the, the Cal team of the predecessor of, of Wilcox's predecessor, and they just were going to air it out. Like, I think this could be an offense that would be pretty scary, but they, that's just not what they do and that isn't what they have done. I mean, they throw the ball a lot, but it's not kind of this type of offense that is, I think, particularly scary. Um, it is an Oregon pass defense that maybe is concerning. So, like, I look at Cal and I go, like, I, I, I'm not totally a, like, I'm not really that concerned about this outcome. I think Oregon's going to win. I've been saying it all week. I don't want to overlook them entirely. I think they've got some really good young players, but 
I also don't think they have an offense that can keep up with Oregon. And we have to know this is a Cal defense that has been one of the worst defenses under Wilcox. He's dead last in the pass, sorry, in the Pac-12 and, and pass defense. Part of that's playing really good pass offenses, but I don't think this is the team to slow this Oregon offensive onslaught. So for Cal to be competitive, they're going to have to score a bunch of games. So, or sorry, to score a bunch of points. So to Matt's point, I was like, if, unless you make this game sloppy and you let Cal hang around and you turn it over and you don't execute very well and the defense does give up some big plays vertically and Jade Knott does break off some big runs, like this is a game you should win soundly. So to me, it's like it, it's almost like play to your strengths, um, which in a lot of cases are Cal weaknesses, and and just and just play a, st- a solid game and you should get out of town without a problem. It's like it's it is kind of like just avoid slipping up because. I think if Oregon plays a B game and Cal plays a B game, Oregon wins by a lot. I think if the only way this game is, is really close is probably if Cal plays an A game and Oregon plays a stinker. Um, and in that case, it's probably a game where maybe it gets a little bit hairy at the end, but I still think Oregon's probably in decent shape because I think they are just more talented across the board. But this Cal team it has my attention for just being kind of an odd an odd team. You know, kind of the more I look at it, the more I think about it, I was like, I, I could see this offense actually being kind of interesting down the road, but I don't think it's right now. I think describing Cal overall as an odd team is, is very it's a it's, it's a perfect way to describe it because I yeah, you I went through all the stats and there's some there's some really good things like Jeremiah Hunter and J. Michael Sturdevant, which is just an excellent name. Like they've combined for almost nine hundred yards and seven touchdowns, sixty seven receptions. And they're two of uh yeah, I don't I don't know where to put them in the in the pack twelve, like Eric was mentioning. But they're they're really good. Like that's just the bottom line is that they're really good. But you look at Plummer and his like Eric mentioned his you know yards or his average pass yards is like six point eight. Like he's not throwing the ball down the field at all. He's just not even throwing it for a first down half the time. Um, and so you kind of wonder like where that's going to be against Oregon's defense, which has been really good in terms of limiting explosive plays down the field, but it hasn't been great in terms of like where the linebackers are sitting in coverage. Um, so I think that is something to look out for. But, you know, I, I looked at Cal's run offense, and it's really not that good. It's really not. And I did some numbers, and you look at the Arizona game where they ran for 354 yards. If you take that out, they've had uh, 78 yards per game on the ground. If you take that 354 out against the worst or the second worst uh, rush defense in the Pac-12 behind Colorado in Arizona. And the last three games has been even worse. I mean, they've ran 78 times for 128 yards against uh, uh, Washington, Colorado, and Washington State. That's 1.6 yards per carry. Um, Oregon's rush defense is is pretty darn good. And even against UCLA and Zach Charbonnet last week, um, they had moments of of being good. And then it's that's a good offensive line. And it's a good running back. It's just a strange, it's a strange game. I mean, I, I think Oregon's going to win. I think they'll win pretty handily. I think they'll cover the spread, which I looked up, Matt, it is 17 still, uh, open to 12 now, up to 17. I think they'll cover that. Um, it's just different from what other Cal teams have looked like when playing Oregon. And I know that Cal has, has given Oregon a lot of trouble in the past. And I think, Eric, you and I talked about this for just a brief second on Wednesday, either Tuesday or Wednesday. But this is a much different Oregon team, especially on offense, compared to this Cal defense, which is kind of similar to what they played in the past, but their past defense isn't nearly as good. Well, this year, Oregon's past offense is, is on paper and just with an eyeball test, just much more efficient and better with Bo Nix as quarterback. Um, and so... You know, I, I, think, I think Cal's defense is good. I think it could give Oregon some trouble, but it's what Dan Lanning says nearly every day now. It's just Oregon's biggest opponent is Oregon. And like both of you guys have gone through, you know, if they, if they have those red zone penalties like they did against Washington State, that's going to that's gonna harm them a bit. Or they have pre-snap penalties on offense and false starts, whatever the case. If they start to shoot themselves in the foot, then it could become interesting. But if they just play a normal game and how they have played for the last two, three weeks of pretty clean football and not that many um, pre-snap penalties and the, the occasional illegal man downfield, which you can't really do anything about. Um, this is a team that's offense is just way better than Cal's defense and their talent level is much better. Um, 
it's a team that I think should cover that spread kind of kind of easily. And uh, lastly, what Matt started out with of how subdued the Cal crowd is, um, 12:30 game in Berkeley. I'm not, I'm not sure how many fans are going to be there, and just in general. Um, can I clarify one thing, and it's it, it, that I think stands out on the rush stats. It's also th those stats include the sacks, and this is another part that for me is a huge issue for Cal. They've been sacked 11 times the last three games for like 76 yards, so you subtract that from the rush numbers. And this season they've been sacked 23 times, which is 11th in the conference, almost worst in the country. Um, mm -hmm they don't protect their quarterback and they have a pretty immobile quarterback. And we're talking to Jackson yesterday, who's currently got a foot injury. So you've got a guy who's already kind of not super mobile, who's gone kind of a bad wheel. So that combination of having an offensive line, he laid out the specifics. You can go check out that podcast of like injuries, right. but then also guys that were supposed to be on the team that weren't on the team and transfer portal guys that haven't panned out. Like it's just kind of a mess. And so this is a Cal offensive line. That's really, really it's bad. Hard. And it, it, it's it's an opportunity for Oregon's defensive line maybe to get right a little bit in terms of getting to the quarterback because it hasn't been something we've seen too much, you know, at quite quite to the degree I think we expected. I'd, I'd like to get Jared's perspective on this because we talked a minute about it on Tuesday's show when he wasn't here because I'm really happy that Jared brought up the, the run mirage of Cal because um, I thought that same thing. Jared, do you think Jaden Ott, if you take out what he did against Arizona, is his numbers even all that impressive? Because I kind of felt like it's very C.J. Verdell-ish in like 2019 where Verdell had like 1,000 yards, but 700 mm -hmm. of it came in like four games. Yeah, I mean, I think that's – it's fair to ask. I still think that Jay Knott's a good player just because of that one performance. Um, I think his offensive line is really poor and he just isn't going to get the opportunities. And while he is a good running back, he's not an elite running back. And when you're a good running back like CJ Burdell, it helps immensely when your offensive line is really good and gives you those opportunities to find a hole and, and break through and then maybe break off a 10 to 15 yard thing. But um, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, he has 274 yards against Arizona, and then his next highest on the season is 104 yards against uh, UC Davis, which we all know is a perennial football powerhouse uh, up there in Davis, California, or down there because now we're in Eugene. Um, yeah, it's it's tough because if you take that game out, he's got around like 80 rushing attempts this season for like a little little less than 400 yards, which isn't great. And again, I attribute that a lot to Cal's offensive line, who hasn't been great all season and then has now, um, I think their starting left tackle is, is out for this game and for the foreseeable future. Um, it's not great. I still like him as a player, but yeah. I, think he's, I think he's still a good running well, back, and I think he could cause some issues out of the backfield in, in the passing game. But I don't know. It's hard for me to just say that – He's and I want to make it clear, I don't think he's a bad back. I just don't think he's even Well, he's a he's a home run threat. And you if you pull you right. pull back the, the layer the onion even more, uh he has like most of his yards on four runs. Uh he had two seventy yard runs in that Arizona game and he had another for fifty. So you I mean he's somebody who if he can get to the next level, he's got extreme he's speed. He's not gonna be caught. So he's a home run threat. So if you're if you're Oregon, if you can get him down, you know, at the line of scrimmage or close, which is what teams have done recently. You limit that, but mm -hmm. if he can break off a couple, he'll put right. up some stats. So um, that that's more my analysis of like he he's he's like your microwave three point shooter, where it's like if you don't guard him and he hits like three threes, suddenly he's going to hit eight threes and have a huge game. But if you clamp down on him and he doesn't get going, you know he ends up right. being kind of not. He's that the valuable. Anthony Mathis of Cal football. There you go. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Did not expect that one on this pod. Love it. I was going to say Sam Hauser, which I guess you you probably wouldn't also expect a Sam Hauser <laughs> reference on an Oregon podcast. And we would expect anything Boston from you on this podcast. I think that's I'd I'd certainly hope so. That's how I want it to be. Is he a Celtics legend already, or is that not? Is he not there yet? No, nah, he kind of stinks to start the year, but if he's open, he'll make a shot. There you go. All right, let's take a quick break. We come back. Uh, we'll dive into some team picks, player picks, and end up with our score predictions. Uh, for Saturday's game. 
All right, welcome back to the Austin Audible's podcast. Uh, previewing, picking, predicting Oregon at Cal. It's a 12.35 kick, like Jared said. It's going to be interesting to see how that crowd looks. It's on FS1. Um, I know people were kind of bummed that Tim Brando, Spencer Tillman called the Washington State game. Those guys are calling the same game uh, t- tomorrow, I should say, at Cal. All right, we'll start off with uh, offensive team, offensive player, and then go to defensive side and then go with our team picks. Um, The offensive team for me, uh, I think they're going to have a huge day on the offensive side of the football. Um, I'm saying Oregon hits 500 or more yards, and this will be the fifth time, the fifth straight time that Oregon has done that this season. And the last time they've had that kind of a run, was in 2014 when they went eight straight games with 500 or more yards. So I'm going 500 for the fifth straight time. And I think it's, I almost did 550, but I felt like that was being a little overconfident. Um, I just, I think Oregon's got the best offense from a balanced perspective in the Pac-12. And to see what they're doing week in, week out, it's pretty impressive. It puts a ton of pressure on their opponent to keep pace, which I think makes them make a mistake and only fuels Oregon even more here. So I'm thinking something big on offense, 500 or more yards for the fifth straight time. Since 2018, I did. I think this is an interesting stat. Since 2018, Cal's played 47 games. Do you know how many teams have scored 40 or more points? Ooh, they haven't done it this year. I know that. Three. You read my uh, story? I'll say five. Jared, did you read my story or did you just guess? Because it's in my scope of Damas, which is up. I might have so you... read your story. Oh, your cheater. Pants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's cheating by everybody, actually reading my content, which is. Everybody go read scope of <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's only three teams since since uh, 2018. Oregon did it in 2018, USC in 19, and then UCLA did it at the very end of last season. Uh, Cal lost all three of those games by quite a few points. As And I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get to how this links in a second, but I think the thing you have to acknowledge is if, if, if this game's played in the 40s, Cal will lose. Like They, they have basically no history of, of winning games that are played. It, you know, I shouldn't say no history, but very, very limited history under Wilcox of winning games that are played kind of in this range. I think Oregon's going to get to 40. That doesn't sound that bold because, as we've established, Oregon's done it for like a month and a half consecutively now. They, they, they've got that streak going. But again, as I said, Cal doesn't allow this kind of uh, scoring output very frequently. Three teams in the last 47 games have done it against them. I think mm-hmm. Oregon becomes number four this weekend. I like it. I'm going with uh, 200 yards on the ground. I think that Oregon's just going to continue to go on the ground and just continue to beat teams. I think Cal's uh, run defense is actually pretty good. I think the, the most they've allowed this season is 147. Yes, 147. So really all they need to do is to set a new high as 148 yards, which I think Oregon could probably do that in their sleep. Um, obviously, Cal's passing defense isn't the best. So maybe Oregon lets Bo Nix cook and they have him throw 35 to 40 times. Um, I don't I don't think they're going to have to do that. I think Oregon is going to have some explosive plays on the ground um, and through the air and just kind of let um, Nick's chill at that 25 to 30 mark in the throwing or in the pass attempts and give Oregon their, their running backs some more opportunities and maybe, maybe back to back Bucky plus 100 yards Ooh. a week. Who knows? Oh Ooh. man. But yeah, Oregon 200 over 200 plus yards on the ground. Eric, you, you brought up uh, Cal's defense. This is a tangent, but the games at Oregon, you know, when they, when they give up 40 or more points and that they win, do you know the last time? they gave up 40 or more points in a game and they won? I didn't go that far back because I just looked to 18. Um, I'm going to say maybe 17. But that was Wilcox's first year. But if, 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 if it's not there, it's probably like pretty close to at, before that because the predecessor to Wilcox, like they threw the ball a lot. Yeah, 2016 against Oregon. Huh. That was the overtime game when they won 52 oh. to 49. Herbert threw that oh, pick yeah. in the end zone. But – I thought that, pretty crazy. They don't play a lot of games where they even yeah. allow forty points, like Eric pointed out. All it's right. like it's like nothing under Wilcox. Yes, uh, under Sonny Dykes, it was like every game they scored forty. But yeah, now defense is a problem for Kevin. Love Sonny Dykes. Good coach. All right, offensive player pick here. Um, I've teetered 
with what one I was going to do, even mid show. I'm going to stick with this one though. Bo Nix is going to average nine and a half yards per play um, in this one. I think he's turned a corner. I think it's very evident that Oregon relies on him throwing the football, but also in the run game and whether it's the threat of running, which allows other players to get clear looks or simply giving him the ball and letting him cook and do, and do damage on the ground. Um, I, I think he's going to have a big game. I was almost going to say 350 total yards, but I, I went maybe the safer route, nine and a half yards per play for Bo Nix. He's going to have another one where Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, there's going to be a lot of people, wow, he's gotten so much better. How did he do this? He, he is playing at a tremendous level we've never seen before. And we have, I don't think we've acknowledged it on our podcast because we haven't been together much as a group, but he like almost swept the national weekly awards last week. Yeah. Won a bunch of those. Dave O'Brien, Maxwell, probably several others I'm forgetting. Guys playing at a really high level. I'm going with the other player who's been really good in the past game, and that's Troy Franklin. Um, I, I, I think what Franklin is doing is, is extremely impressive. You know, I, I tried to do some – prorated projections for like what his end of season stat line would look like and if he continues at this pace it's 70 receptions 1122 yards 10 touchdowns which would be like one of the three best receiving seasons in program history um be the fourth most single season for receptions fourth in yards and third in touchdowns so he's already on a really good pace Mm -hmm. and we have to note there have been a couple of games where he wasn't super productive, and I think this is one where he will be. You know, we mentioned it earlier. Um, Cal's pass defense is not a strength right now. I think this could be a big Troy Franklin game. I think he's also going, going back. I was going to say that was exactly where I was going, Matt. He's going back to the Bay. He is a East Palo Alto native. Um, he's he's going to be back in front of you know some family, some friends. I expect a warm reception from him, and I think he's going to have a great game. Um, His current career high in receiving yards was 137 in that win over Wazoo. I think he goes 138 or more for his third 100-yard receiving game of the season. I like it. I like it. I'm going Nick's 300 yards plus passing yards. I don't think it's any surprise that we're all going in this passing attack. Um, Yeah, I I, I mean, I looked at, at what other quarterbacks have done against Cal's defense this year. Um, Arizona, Washington, and Washington State all threw for 340 plus yards. Um, Colorado threw for 310, which is their third highest on the season. And Colorado, as Eric's reaction indicates, if you're not watching, his eyeballs just popped up because Colorado's quarterback situation is very poor. And the fact that they allowed over 200 yards is not, is not a good indicator of, of defensive success. Um, and so, with those teams, I think, I, I mean, it's pretty clear to me, and I don't know about you guys, but uh, I think Bonex is a better quarterback than everybody else who threw for that many yards uh, against this Cal defense. And I think Oregon's weapons are just as good, if not better, than almost all of those teams. I think they're, yeah, I think they're better than all of them. Um, so I think this is a pretty easy match in terms of what Bonex is going to do. Um, it's been a little bit since he's thrown over 300 yards, but after going against UCLA's defense and showcasing his talent there and his progressions, um, yeah, I got him over 300 yards, and I don't think it's going to be too hard for him. All right, I'm gonna we're gonna shift now to team defense, and my team defense kind of plays into my uh, individual pick. So just as a tease here, um, Cal is their offensive line straight up stinks. They're not very good. I I think Oregon is going to have a ton of pressure in the backfield. Whether that relates to a ton of sacks possible. Will it lead to a lot of rushed throws or poor throws? Absolutely. Um, I, I'm predicting Oregon's defense is going to have a havoc rate uh, over 15 in this football game. I, I think they're going to be all over the field. Pressures, tackles for loss, sacks, interceptions, um, havoc rate for Oregon's defense is going to be over 15 points in this football game. Uh, Plummer is going to be, especially with the bum leg, is going to have a long day, and he will be very thankful when the game is over. Yeah, we're on the same kind of wavelength here. I'm more focused on the sacks. 
I think this is going to be the season high. Um, current season high was five against Washington State, who, by the way, is last in the conference in protecting the quarterback. Um, Surprising. The only, the only team other than Cal to have, uh, I think, more than 20 sacks this year, I think. I, I don't know. I know Cal had 23 and Washington State had like 26. Uh, I think this is a game where Oregon can get to the quarterback a little bit more effectively than they have previously. As I established earlier, last three opponents have, have averaged like almost four per game. And I think Oregon has the ability to be really disruptive up front. And, you know, if DJ Johnson doesn't play, maybe I take a step back on this one. Um, I think he probably will play. I, I don't, I can't really explain Wednesday's absence, but we've seen players this year miss a Wednesday play in the game on Saturday. I think that'll be the outcome. Um, I just think this is a Cal offensive line that's really struggling right now. And I don't think Oregon's the team to really improve upon, you know, in that regard. And I also think this is a game where Oregon's offense will have success, which will force Cal to need to throw it. Cal's going to want to throw the football to hang around. And, and honestly, Cal's probably best trying to throw the football with what they have outside. I just think there's going to be opportunities to, to kind of to get after Plummer, who – if he does have time to throw, has proven to be, I think, a pretty admirable quarterback. Like somebody who can make a lot of throws, has made some, I think, has some pretty darn impressive games. Like last week against Washington might have been his best game. Three touchdowns was pretty accurate throwing it. I just think he's going to have a lot of pressure in his face. And as Matt said, probably leads to some turnovers, but I'm focused on the sacks. I'll say six or more. Wow. Six or more. I That's like it. Lot. I like it. Um, I'm not going with the sacks just yet, or the tackles for loss just yet. I'm saying that Oregon's team defense holds Cal to under 100 yards rushing. Um, I went through the numbers like I did before with if you take out that Arizona game, um, how they only average 78 yards on the ground. And like Eric mentioned, it includes sacks. So this, this could work very nicely if Oregon continues to uh, get to the quarterback and pressure him and get some more tackle for loss or sacks. Um, Cal has ran for over 100 yards just twice this season, once against UC Davis, like I mentioned, known powerhouse, and then Notre Dame, an actual known powerhouse. Um, I don't anticipate that they're going to have a lot of success in the ground. Um, it's a, not a great offensive line, as both Matt and Eric just mentioned. Um, Oregon's defensive front is pretty good against the run, and they were pretty good against UCLA. They held them to their second fewest yards of the season, um, tied with Washington at 184. Um, I just think that there's an opportunity for Oregon's front seven to get back to where they were um, probably prior to the UCLA game in terms of statistical values of team stats over the season um, and just make their make their impact shown. I think that they're going to trust their secondary here uh, against Cal and Jake Plummer. Uh, so I, I, I got them holding Cal under 100 team yards rush, 100 Love yards it. rush team. I don't know. <laughs> I, <love laughs> I it. can't speak. <laughs> All right, uh, individual pick here. Um, I said the Oregon's havoc rate would be pretty good. I think, like Eric said, I think sacks will be plentiful in this football game. There will be a lot of pressures on the quarterback, and I think that's going to lead to some opportunities for some interceptions. And I think we're going to see Brian Addison, who's playing really good football the last couple of weeks. He's kind of found his groove here in that secondary at safety. Um, I think he's going to show up in this football game and he's going to have an interception uh, and it's going to be a pretty impactful one. Um, I just, I'm really impressed with the development and the progress he has made in 2022. Um, it was to a point where in 2021 at the end of the year, you were like, wow, it, it's difficult to see him play on the defensive side of the football. It's just not working. We don't know why. Um, but a year later, things are progressing. He's playing really good. And I think he's going to have a big impact in this game with an interception. We spoke to Brian on uh, Wednesday. And, you know, I wrote, I have a piece up on the site. It's kind of about his progression. And he gives a lot of credit to Coach Lanning for kind of unleashing the physicality he's needed. I thought that stood out um, on Saturday. That that hit on Charbonnet was, I think, one of the more impressive tackles you've seen from a defensive back this season. He had another one, I think, against Stanford um, earlier in the year that was just like, oh, gosh, like you just took a guy out. Um, PFF has him, has by far Oregon's top defensive player 
Um, he's the only player on the team in the 80s on defense in terms of their grades, um, which, which, is, which is a really good grade. Uh, and I think he has a coverage grade in the 90s. So he is a pass defense specialist. I like the pick, Matt. He seems to be a player that's just kind of playing at his best right now. And that's a good guy to bet on. I, I'm betting on another guy who's been, I think, playing progressively better. I think Brandon Darler started this season maybe a little bit slow. I think he's been playing his best football recently. And this is a matchup that's a plus matchup, as we mentioned earlier, which we talked a lot about Cal and its inability to you know, protect the quarterback. You look at the tackle for loss numbers, it's just as bad. They have given up 48 in seven games, so that's like almost seven per game, which is just a lot um, to average for an offense over the course of a season. Um, you know, I think if you pull that back and you look at just conference games, it gets even worse. Uh, the last three – Last two, I should say, Colorado had 10 tackles for loss. Washington had nine. Notre Dame had eight. Arizona only had two, but we know that Arizona defense isn't great. Even UNLV had eight. So I, I think this is a game where Oregon can can really wreak some havoc, and I like Dorless in particular. Leads the team in tackles for loss. He had three early this year against Stanford. I think he's going to either reach that or surpass that. So I'm saying three or more tackles for loss for Dorless. Three or more for just Dorless. Thank that's impressive. That's a lot. Yeah. Eric's going um, hard with these defense yeah, picks here. I like him. I have Dorless and DJ Johnson over four and a half combined tackles for loss. So my individual uh, my individual defense is a duo. Um I think I think DJ Johnson will play. Um I know that he wasn't at practice on Wednesday, but he was there on Tuesday when what we were able to see. Um like this is a chance to like I was saying earlier, get this defensive front seven into a rhythm. And there's no better way to do that than, than play a team that you're just better than. Um, I like Oregon's opportunities here. I think Doris is coming along really well. Um, I looked at the game log from Cal's last matchup against Washington. Washington was all over the place with tackles for loss. And I think this is an opportunity for Oregon's defense, which I think their front seven is is a, a, a bit better than, than Washington's front seven to make their mark. So I got Doris and DJJ over four and a half. All right, game picks here. Um, I've gone back and forth, and I think I'm going homer on this pick here. I'll self-admit, a little homer here. Um, I I like I, – I think I respect Cal's defense. They don't give up the big play very often. The stats show that team scoring goes down when they play California. Just go look at Washington, one of the most explosive offenses uh, in the Pac-12 this season. Um, scored just 30 or scored just 28 points. Um, 31 is the fewest points they've allowed this season. Um, that being said, I think Oregon has the better players. I think they have the most balanced offense in the conference. I, th I think they've got the best player on the football field um, when Oregon's offense and defense is out there. They probably have the five best players on the field when Oregon's offense and Cal's defense is out on the football field. And you combine that with a coaching staff that doesn't let off the gas and try and run the clock out, I think we're going to see some points. So Oregon's going to cover, and it's going to be that the highest scoring total Cal has allowed in quite some time, 56-24. Um, I think it's going to be a huge number for Oregon, and it's probably going to look even – it could even look even better if it wasn't for some late garbage touchdowns that Cal maybe tacks on late in the fourth quarter or, you know, early fourth when Oregon kind of pulls its, its starters. I was uh, just looking at it. Uh, the most Cal is living up under Wilcox is 45. So you're going 11 points more. And I think this Oregon offense is certainly capable of it. We'll see. I mean, that is, that is, that's a big, that's a, just like my tackles for loss and, Predictions and sacks predictions are big. That's a big score. Uh, yeah. That would be really impressive to see. That would be the second most points they've scored this year. Um, and I think that would be probably due to just firing on all cylinders again. And maybe the defense does some stuff because of some turnovers, which we could all I agree could see happen. I think it will be a little lower scoring. I don't have Oregon over 50. I do have them over 40. I established that earlier. It'd be weird if I now predicted less than 40. <laughs> no, it's actually going to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, but I think yeah, I think over forty. I think it's going to be closer. I also have them covering. I'm going to go forty-two twenty-four. Um, so just a narrow cover. 
Is that your prediction, Jared? Did you guys steal it from you? That no, it's a good, it's close though. That's for sure. I, 42 feels appropriate. It feels about the average. I think it is literally the exact average for them on the season this year, actually at 42, <laughs> you, I, I, you could look it up. Um, and 24 feels like about what, Look this up for me, Jared. I just did this off the top. I didn't actually. I think Cal's yes, offense. Sir. Cal's offense averages about twenty-four, and Oregon's offense averages about forty-two. I got you. So, would you uh, like? Would you like the numbers? Yeah, give me those. What are the, what are the averages for the offenses? Uh, it's it's nearly exactly what you said. Oregon's forty-two point four, and Cal is twenty-three-three. Yeah. So I think the teams are just going to score their averages. Apparently, that's my prediction. The teams just score what they normally <laughs> score, and <laughs> one very is more than the other. Well, yeah, and it's very simple, and that's why and that's why Oregon wins and covers. Um, I, surprisingly, I didn't actually plan that out. I just was off the top of my head as I was saying, going, I think that's actually really close to what they what they average. Um, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I think for the reasons we've already established, this is a really favorable matchup for this Oregon team. Um, again, I don't expect Cal to to win games scored in the 40s. As Matt said, like Justin Wilcox has basically not done that, really. If the opponent scores in the 40s, they're not going to win. I think Oregon's going to score a lot of points because I think this Oregon offense is – Really, really good. This is the best Oregon offense from my perspective since 2014. Maybe at times with 15 with Vernon, they had some really explosive games when he was healthy. But it's been a minute, and I just expect there to be points had. I think Nix is going to be effective. He's really firing on all cylinders. We've got a bunch of good content up on the site about kind of his um, agency and autonomy in terms of calling plays and changing plays at the line and making checks and kind of how involved he's been with that and how that's allowed him to play free but also <clears throat> to also get them into really good situations so i just think the offense is going to score i don't see this being the defense that stops them and i think for cal like i think this is about what they are offensively i think they've got some guys i think they'll give oregon some trouble i wouldn't be surprised if this game is relatively close at halftime maybe this is a game where it is like 24 14 or 21 14 28 14 but then the second half they kind of continue to extend it out a little bit so um, I like Oregon to win. I think they cover. I don't think it's a blowout, blowout quite where Matt's at. But I also, I also wouldn't be surprised at all if it if it gets there. Like, I, I think that's on the table in this one too. I have Oregon winning forty two twenty one. So very similar to Eric's. I have them covering. It's winning by twenty one points. You know, I, again, I wouldn't be surprised if, if this game ends up closer to Matt's score. Um, I just think at the end of the day, Cal's defense is really good. This is a this is a group that when teams go and play them, they score significantly less or like, you know, less than their season average. Um, I've got Oregon winning, putting like Eric does, like right at their season average and Cal just below it. Um, but the, the thing is, is like when you're averaging 42 points a game, you're doing something right. Um, I think Oregon's offense will will look like it's firing on all cylinders. I think, though, they might – settle for a field goal here or there rather than a touchdown. Um, Jackson Sermon is a, is a really good linebacker for, for Cal, former uh, Washington player. Um, I think that there's some, there's some obvious talent on both Cal's offense and defense here. Um, I just think that they're way overmatched in this situation and, and in this game. Uh, the 1230 midday Berkeley crowd is, is not going to help them, I don't think. I don't know if it would, if it were a 5 p.m. or an 8 p.m. game either. But at least with the 8 p.m. game, it would be Pac-12 after dark game. We all know what happens there. You know, this one is going to be smack on, I, guess, I don't know if, Fox, if FS1 is a national uh, channel, but it's pretty national. So, again, this is another opportunity for somebody on their couch in uh, Kansas to flip through and be like, all right, well, there's this game. And they watch Oregon and can just see their offense once again. Um, the more public spotlight for Oregon in these types of situations, the better. Uh, again, I have Nick's having a great day. Like Eric just went through, there's been a lot of talk about him this past week, especially after his UCLA performance, and rightfully so, there should be. Um, I think he'll get, as, as we were all saying earlier, I think he'll get even more attention after this week. Um, I just I just think that this is a terrible matchup for Cal and a, and a really good one for Oregon. Even if they just scored their season average, they're still putting up over 40. So 42-21 Oregon. There you got it. I think all three of us are expecting good games from Oregon in this one. Should be an exciting outcome from this football game. Uh, next time you hear from us, it'll be post-game edition of the Odds and Audibles podcast uh, down here in Berkeley. 
Thanks for listening to the Friday show. We look forward to talking to you Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. And until then, you've been listening to the Austin Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.